Hi guys, um, welcome to another exciting NoVeg webinar series. Um, my name is Kevin, I'm the marketing and social media intern here at NoVeg, and we have with us, for the first time ever, Aurora, who will be co-hosting this webinar as well. Aurora, can you say hi for, to everybody? Hi, everybody, and this is actually my second time. I was substituting for you. When was it? A couple of weeks ago when you were on vacation? <laughs> yes, I was actually in Korea, and it was uh, very fun. But uh, shall we get started? Awesome. Um, well, yeah, welcome to another exciting NoVeg webinar series, and I'm very excited to be recording this live and to have with us Pixelogic's own Paul Gabri. Paul, Paul, can you say hi to everybody here? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. I okay, I, uh, but I might need to. You might need to kick me out because my go-to webinar just is frozen right now. Oh. So, it's not really that. As long as you guys can see my screen and hear me. Okay. Then well, we're in good shape. Okay. Cool. But yeah, we have a uh, we have with us Paul from ZBrush uh, for R5, and today he's going to be talking about ZBrush. Uh, he'll be covering the newest features of ZBrush for R5, and these include an in-depth understanding of how panel loops uh, can be used for several modeling techniques. Uh, this webinar today will also cover hard surface modeling. Uh, we'll take a look at new polish features and finish off the webinar with a BPR render system to create a tune or comic book render. So uh, this webinar is um, designed for ZBrush users at all levels and artists is interested in seeing the newest ZBrush features in action. Uh, enthusiasts, you're welcome, more than welcome to actually check it out too as well. Um, Paul, I'm gonna give a bio about you. Is that okay? Go for it. Okay. So if you guys don't, if you guys don't know who Paul is, Paul Gabri is a Pixelogic's 3D application engineer who works with several studios such as Legacy Effects, Disney, Bad Robot. I think they did special effects for Lost, right? Uh, well, we were used in like uh, Super 8. Uh, you know, most of the recent stuff. Uh, I don't know how much we're using Lost. Obviously, Star Trek, the upcoming Star Trek, the older Star Trek. It's all J.J. Abrams. Yeah. Okay. J.J. Abrams himself actually uses the Oh, my gosh. That's cool. That's so cool. Uh, Pixar, for example. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Paul's been uh, working on their digital sculpting pipeline using the leading industry application known as ZBrush. Uh, he has also been involved with the development of ZBrush and he's worked with artists around the world, studios, schools, and uh, he's just been traveling here and about here and to uh, highlighting the various new tools in ZBrush. Um, Paul uh, graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Bowling Green and was an extension student at Noman School of Visual Effects. Uh, Novich is very honored to have Paul join our webinar uh, collaborating with us today as well. So. But before we kick off the webinar, um, I'm, we want to talk about what we do at NoVeg as a uh, leading online design software store and also as an online community. Uh, if you have any questions about, if you want to purchase a version of ZBrush FAR 5 in the United States, uh, ZBrush is available from NoVeg as a digital delivery with a zero, zero, zero sales tax. So uh, if you want to check it out, do contact us at Bob. Bob at Novich.com. Um, Aurora, I think you want to talk about what, some of the other things we do as well? Yes. Yes, thank you, Kevin. So here in Novage, we've been busy. Um, we put together a new Tumblr blog called The World is 3D that's dedicated to media and entertainment professionals. And you can also connect on Twitter at The World is 3D. So um, one other thing that we've been working on is revamping our main blog. We feature um, twice a week, every week, interviews with artists and innovators. And just a few weeks ago, for example, we published a piece about ZBrush, so check it out. And of course, you're all familiar, um, I think, with our three online communities, Wikicad, Vector Working, and Rhino Jungle. And I highly recommend that if you're not a member of Rhino Jungle yet, that you join it if you are a user of ZBrush. So uh, Kevin, what, um, what's coming up next week? I mean, in two weeks, I'm sorry, in two weeks on our um, webinar series. Uh, well, in two weeks, uh, Novich will be having our next episode, episode 66, and we will have with us Michael from VSR Virtual Shapes, and today, uh, no, not today, but he'll be talking about how fast, precise, and affordable surface modeling can be done with VSR. Uh, up until recently, the creation of high-quality, technically flawless surfaces used to be the exclusive domain 
of high-end systems. Uh, VSR broke this barrier, and Michael will be talking about how VSR can provide outstanding quality, performance, and possibilities available to a broader range of users at substantially lower cost on, as a plugin for uh, Rhino 3D. So if you want to check that out, for more details, visit novedge.com forward slash webinar series. Um, I also want to say that uh, today's presentation will be about 40 minutes long, and in a moment, Paul will have the floor. Uh, if you have any questions at any time during the presentation, please post them into the chat window so we can answer them live during the Q&A session. Uh, today's webinar is recorded, so if you re want to rewatch the ZBrush webinar and it's in full entirety, you can always uh, find it at our NoVeg webinar series channel through Vimeo and YouTube. Now, with that said, Paul, are you there? I'm here. Oop, not yet. Hey. Yes, I can hear you. Hello? Um, yes, yes. Hello? Uh, hello? Okay. Yeah, my, my go-to <laughs> webinar is frozen, so um, I won't be able to see him. We, we might chance if you guys want to kick me out and I can log back in, and hopefully do you, my... Do you want me to kick you out right now? Yeah, go ahead and kick me out, because I can't... The, the, it's frozen, so I can't look at questions or anything like that. So okay. Go ahead and make me um, the organizer so I can see the questions, Kev. Please. Uh... Give me a second here. All right, you officially have control, and I will turn you... Me, the presenter. Yes. All right, take it away. Okay, and... You guys can see my screen? We're in ZBrush Central. All right, sweet. Hey, all right, a little bump in the road, people. Don't worry. It happens all the time. Just stay on the path, okay? Here we go. So I want to start with <clears throat> a little bit of things that I'll be covering. I'm going to cover all the new features in ZBrush that we can cover in this 45 minutes that we have, 40 minutes that we have. So I just want to make sure you guys know that we've actually created some videos on a lot of stuff I'm going to be covering. So even though this is 40 minutes and some of you might be sitting there scribing some notes and things like that, and don't don't worry about if you don't remember what I said and what I got because right here in ZBrush Central, we actually when we put new videos up, we give you guys these little icons to let you know there's new videos up, and we've created a bunch of videos uh, with Michael Popovich on panel loops. So here's a great section for you guys that we're going to be covering here in this webinar, so that if you're not able to make the notes fast enough or something like that, or my wonderful East Coast accent starts to kick in and I talk really fast like this and no one really understands what I'm saying but myself. Don't worry, we've got some videos here for you, okay? So, of course, what this does is send you straight to pixelogic.com. And for those that are new, um, it's actually going here into the education section and going right here to video tutorials. And for those that are new, does, how many new people do we have in ZBrush here? <clears throat> go, ahead and, go ahead and raise your hands. Raise your hands. Raise them higher than the monitor. Yes, Wes, higher than the monitor so I can see them. Yes, all right. Good, good. Put your hands back down. Expert users, hands up. Hands up. Okay, great. I can't really see your hands, guys. It's just a fun joke. Okay, so this is the beginning section of the Z Classroom. Okay, so for those that have never used ZBrush, this is a good place to go right here, okay, and start with these 12 videos. And for those that are, have been using ZBrush for maybe a little bit um, and those that are new, this Getting Started Guide is definitely a must. Any new user or someone that's been using ZBrush for a while always find this guide very useful because it's very easy to read, you know, it's not a lot of gibberish and it's just highlighting the major features of ZBrush and then linking you to tutorials and videos and more information. So it's a great way to learn the application. So I just wanted to, to start with this so you guys had somewhere to go even after we're done this webinar. Okay? So Without further ado, hold on. Okay, I want to get going into ZBrush. I like the DD says in betweeners. I like that. I like that. That's a good one. I like that. I've never heard that one before. Okay, so I want to start in ZBrush with my amazing sphere. Woo! -hoo! Yay! So pretty. Okay, and I want to cover or start with covering panel loops. This is a really really cool hard surfacing tool. Okay. And uh, I, we had a question about reverse engineering certain things. So I want to I 
I'll end with that and cover that so that question gets answered to that person, which will have a Hey, Paul, I think you're having an error with the screen. I just wanted to give you a notice. There's, everybody seems to be saying the same thing in the chat, in the questions box. I can't see your screen either. Okay, what about now? No. It, it's still in Z Classroom. Yeah, it's frozen in Z Classroom. Okay, how about now? Okay, now there you go. Oh. There you go. Okay. So I want to, thanks, guys. I want to cover um, the panel loops. I want to start with the panel loops for you guys um, and show you how easy you can really start kicking some stuff out. So kind of just give you an idea, this is something that I started making with the topology brush, which if we have time, we'll touch base on that. So I started creating this horse and this mech horse, but I started creating the horse, okay, with the thought of just creating a dynamesh piece first, okay, and then going into uh, thinking about what I can do with this. So I'm going to show you guys this workflow, and we are just having a lot of technical issues right now. My control key is stuck in the Wacom driver right now. Wow. Come on. Let go of it. Sorry about this, guys. We're just having a lot of technical issues today. So <clears throat> this is the start kind of where I went with the horse and then I'm going to show you guys what I actually did using panel loops and I'll show you guys the process of how I started going about this. So this is the panel loops version so that you guys can see this. Okay, and I'll, I'll go a little bit slow because I don't know how your, your feedback is as far as the playback on the screen. Okay, and then I'll show you guys on ZBrush Tensor where I put up more information also on this horse. So I want to cover first with what I was doing. So that's kind of why I actually had this sphere up, all right? And I've put my camera angle way up, so that's why you're seeing a lot of distortion. So I'm going to drop this way down so there's not so much distortion. And we're going to turn on these floor grid here. So what that does for us is turn on a floor grid, okay, which gives us that world that we're used to maybe if we're coming from a 3D application, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to dock the draw palette over here, and we're going to start using this floor grid as an advantage to us, okay? So I really bumped up the floor grid size because my horse is so big. So I'm just going to make the floor grid size a little bit smaller so you guys can see what's going on, okay? And what I'm going to do was within the draw palette, I'm going to tell ZBrush that let's turn up our frame because something I want to iterate and what's beneficial about the floor grid is you can start seeing a red, a blue, and then there's a green line in the middle, okay? And what that is, is your, your X, Y, and Z axis, okay? So I'm going to start using this to my advantage because obviously I can see along the X here. So this is going to be my X symmetry point, okay, here. And I'm actually going to come out of perspective mode so we don't have any distortion at all. And I'm going to start working on this piece and turning it into the horse again, okay? So the first thing that I did was, and I see a, this from a lot, okay, of users starting out with hard surface in ZBrush, is right now we have a sphere with some subdivision levels. Let's actually turn this into a Dynamesh, okay? And I, I'm actually going to start try starting a little bit lower in the resolution, which is 32. Now, because this has subdivision levels, the minute I click on Dynamesh, you're going to get this warning asking, do you want to freeze the subdivision levels or not? I'm going to say no. I'm not worried about subdivision levels at this time. So if you look at my polyframe mode, this is what I got. I actually like to start this low. So what the resolution is controlling in Dynamesh is how many polygons are we going to have. So for example, if I start just grabbing a brush and start sculpting on items, okay, and then I read Dynamesh by holding control and click and dragging, you can see we redistribute the polygons. Now, if I started upping this resolution, okay, and doing that, you can see we get more polygons. Because I'm starting to build out a base mesh, okay, I'm going to start low, and I'm going to be starting at 32, okay? So this is what I want to start at. So again, I'm just going to redistribute my polygons. Might help if I didn't hit the Alt key. And then I can start going and working on this. So let's go ahead and start building a horse. But I don't know about the rest of you. I don't necessarily know exactly what a horse looks like perfectly in my mind. So I want to bring in some reference images, okay? So I'm going to use this floor grid. That's why I started with turning that on. So in the draw palette, okay, we have the capability to have a front, back, okay, up, down, and left, right, okay? And you can see there's images loaded here. So here's the side of a horse, here's the front and back of the horse, 
Okay. So what I've done is just imported those textures through here into our texture palette. Okay, I'm just saving time because you guys don't really want to see me searching for textures in finance. All I did was go here, import in the textures. Okay, so let's let's see what happens. Okay, in here in the floor grid, I'm going to turn on the magnifier so you guys can really see this. You see that there's a Y here and there's a Z and X. What that is controlling is what axis of floor grid do you want to turn on. Okay, so when I turn all three on and hit floor, okay, you're going to see that the images now are starting to come in. Okay, and why those images are coming in is because I already have them selected. So we have the capability of making those image obviously more opaque or less opaque or your opacity. Okay, and you can see that the floor grid's kind of set up to my horse. So you can see that obviously I started with the head and worked my way down. Okay, so what's nice is let's just focus on only the head for this sake. Okay, so what I'm going to do is snap to mesh. And what that does is going to readjust my grid to snap to the mesh, okay? And now I want to swap out the images, okay? So what I'm going to do is click on this little icon right here, okay? And I want to swap that out with, say, the front of the horse, okay? Now I'm at the front of the horse. Let's get all my defaults back here because I've been, I've been playing with this, of course. And now you can see that I have that image there. Also notice that I'm looking through the sphere at the image. What's really great about this is you can actually roll this enhancement back and forth. And when I'm working at this stage, I like to actually turn this up pretty high. So I'm kind of just looking at the line of the surface. Okay. And really, again, that's focusing then on my silhouette because that's really what's important to me. Okay. And then I have to change out my left, right. Okay, and again, I'm going to set these back to the defaults so you guys can see what's happening here. <clears throat> and let's select this image and select the side view. Okay, so you can see we got a nice side view of a horse, and then we got the front view of the horse. Now I kind of want to do some editing, so let's take a look at what this can do really quick. All right, because I have an image here and I have an image here, I can actually switch. And what I'm doing is switching from the back image to the front image. I'm just switching between the images. Okay? I can flip. Okay? I can rotate it 90 degrees. I can be really cool and inverse it. Now we're talking x-ray vision. This is fun right here. Okay? And of course you saw that I can adjust the scale that we have of any image. I can adjust horizontal and I can adjust vertical. And then I do have a free range of motion. Here. So this is really great, especially if you start working on likenesses or your sculpting in particular. What I really want to focus on is this adjustment button. Okay, so I'm going to click this button, and what this does is load up a editor for you guys, and I'm going to use this editor to actually crop off the part of the horse that's really important to me, which is just this part of the head. So I'm just using these red circles to crop down to what I want, and then I'm going to hit OK, and then you can see the image is automatically adjusted. So now I want to do the same thing to this image here. So I'm going to adjust that. And let's go ahead and adjust that up and say OK. And now you can see we, we're focusing on the images that we want to focus on, okay? which is the front and the side. Now what's really cool about this is you see if I scroll over my mesh, you can see that there's these lines. Okay? And here I'm going, to, I'm going to drop the floor grid now opacity frame a little bit. Okay, just so it's not so strong. And you can see those red, green, and blue lines. Those are lines projecting from where your brush is sitting on the surface. So this can help you start lining up, okay, and seeing, hey, do the eyes actually line up on the images. So you can see that red line shooting the one eye and the blue line shooting the other eye. I know I've got a pretty good lined up surface right now. So now because I have a Dynamesh, all I need to do now is start playing with this, maybe make my brush size a little bit bigger, and then just start shaping this to the image. Okay? So this is definitely one approach that you guys can use. And I did do this for the head of my horse. This is exactly what I did. Then I can read Dynamesh and continue pushing the surface around, switching to the front. Wow, that's a, a, a horse with like doors on it. Okay? And start moving it around, smoothing it back will help me. And because I'm dealing with such low polygon count, it's easy for me to start moving the surface around. Right? Okay, so this is one way that we can do this. All right. Now another way, and it's because I prefer a little bit of my drawing world sometimes, 
is using the drawing world. Okay, and what I mean by that is I'm going to use another tool which is called Shadowbox. So instead of having a Dynamesh, okay, we're going to open up Shadowbox. And then I'm going to go ahead and click Shadowbox, and you instantly can see that the images are fitting to our Shadowbox. So I'm just going to clear out the mask, and what this is going to allow me to do is I can start drawing out the surface. Okay, so I can just start masking out, and I'm instantly going to get geometry. So, so you guys can see that better. My opacity right, of my images has turned up so much that I'm going to drop that down, okay, just so you guys can see what's happening. All right, and I'll make that roll off. And when I'm working in Shadowbox, I always like to turn on Transparency and Ghost. That allows me just to even see things better. Now you can see all I have to do is mask quickly out. And this is like the old school paint by numbers for those that remember those days. You know, that's where some of my art started with is just grabbing these paint by number images. Right? And then I can say, okay, now let's go to the front and let's paint out that horse, front of the horse. And then there you go. So let's turn off the floor grid. Okay. Let's come out of Shadowbox now and see what we got. And we've done it. We've made Florida. Excellent. Or or maybe Italy. One of the that's more Italy right there. We get a little couple of Sicily. But it could be Florida too. So what's nice about this, I got a great start. And this is the point, okay, of using something like a Dynamesh or Shadowbox. And now what I like to start doing is just start blocking in the rest of my horse. Okay, and what's really great is if I turn my floor grid on, I still have my images there to use as a reference. Okay? And if I ever want to turn off, okay, these lines that are projecting, because it's just it's not, I don't like it the way it's working, okay? We can do that. And what I'm using right now is the trim dynamic to just start trimming back the surface and just start getting some shape into the surface, okay? Because this is what we use Shadowbox for, just to give us a nice little base mesh. Okay? So you can see how I started doing this and then switching to different brushes and then switching into maybe getting start getting the eyes going and start getting the nostrils of the horse turned in place and start getting that mouth where it needs to be. Okay? So you can see and then at any point in time again, I can switch back to Dynamesh if I want to. Okay, so maybe I want to try up in my resolution and switching back into Dynamesh, and now I'm in Dynamesh mode again. But I started, right, by getting the base with Shadowbox, right? But now I'm back into Dynamesh. That way you guys can have back this capability. If I start doing things like this and I really want to start pushing in that nostril of the horse, I can read Dynamesh, right? And I can redistribute my polygons that way. So you can see that this workflow can really, what it can start doing for you. All right, and let's say maybe I want to start putting some ears on him, okay? So I'm going to switch to the move brush and just start pulling out some ears on him and then just re mesh. <coughs> Excuse me, just coughing my... And then start shaping up what you want. Now, how did I start making this be hard surface? Because that's really what we want to get into, okay? And so what we started to use was, shadow, uh, was polygrouping. So you can see here, this has all got one polygroup or in one color, okay? And we're going to start using an edge loop here. We're going to start using this panel loops feature. So what I want to start doing is blocking off where I maybe want to start making metal pieces. Okay, so I'm going to say I want a metal piece right here, okay? And you can see what I'm doing is using masking to get on both sides, okay? And then I can make a new polygroup by hitting Control w Okay, so now I have a new polygroup there, okay? And what I'm going to do is, so you guys can see this even better, I'm actually going to turn off my light caps for you guys so that we're just going to use the normal lights, okay? So give it a minute to, because I think i got about 16 lights in the scene here, and then we'll switch to a better material for you guys to really um, see this. Uh, let me find it. There we go. All right, and we'll take this material. And what I'm doing is just adjusting the material and making it a little bit brighter. See if you can see my ambience down quite a bit here. So I'm just turning on my ambience so you guys can really see. All right, so you can see there's polygroup now started here and on both sides. So all I'm doing is masking off and saying, oh, I want another one here, coming along this way, 
and control W. Okay? So you can see what happened is I started polygrouping inside. So like if you went like this, right? I'm also going across that purple. Maybe that's not what I want. Okay? So what I'm actually going to turn on is in the brush palette, okay? In auto masking, this very top slider here, I'm going to turn this to 100, which is masked by polygroup. So what that tells ZBrush is the first polygroup I click on, that's actually the only one that you get to mask out. Okay? So you can see here I'm just starting to build the pieces around the eye. Right? So no matter if I start here in the red, you see I can't come across until I hit the red again. So this became really handy for me to quickly start kicking out how I want these metal pieces to look on my horse. Right? And again, I'm clicking on Control W right, to make the new polygroup. And notice how low my polygons are. I'm not really that concerned with getting something that's really hard surface at this point. I'm more concerned about just mapping out my metal pieces and knowing what that's going to look like on my horse, right? And seeing, okay, I'm going to have a metal piece that comes around like this maybe. And you can see the freedom we get here, and we'll repolygroup that one because it's close in color to the blue. Okay, so you get the idea here. I'm not going to continue this whole process for you guys. You guys will get bored, okay? And let's make the bottom piece here. So we have the bottom piece and control W. All right, so if I show just the red and then I inverse, you can see what we have started, okay? So let's delete that red piece, okay, and take a look at what we can start doing. So I'm going to delete my hidden. So the only thing we're looking at is this part of my horse now. All right, and let's really take a look at the panel loops, all right? So if I just go by default, okay, and hit panel loops, this is what I got. We're instantly creating... Okay, and the, the feedback's all right, guys, on everything since I'm in polyframe mode. Spigoli, Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. Feedback's fine. I'm going to take this stun silence as a yes. Okay, so you can see here what happens is every polygroup that we make, okay, becomes its own separate panel. Okay, so what's great about this is let's start playing with this. Number one. I don't like the gap that we have through here, so let's undo. And I'm going to start using this thickness. So as I start bumping up this thickness slider, okay, number one, what it's going to do is start creating thicker panels, as you guys can see here, all right? And I'm going to start creating a little bit bigger gap between the panels. Now, I kind of like that thickness that's happening here, but I don't like <clears throat> the panel exactly as far as the beveling happening and I want to put a little more thickness in it. So I'm going to undo that. I'm going to show you guys another per thing that you can use, which is this profile curve. Okay, so by default, you can see we have the outer going in, going into the inside surface, and going this is to the inside. So it's out to in. Okay, so when I click panel loops, what we're looking at is this bevel that's happening. Okay, so outer surface, to the inner surface, so outer surface into the inner surface, okay? If I count these cubes up here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay? We have eight blocks here, and what we're doing is using that as also control that bevel and also control the depth, okay, of where the, the beveling is going to start. So at the fourth square, okay, that's meaning meet the panels exactly together. So for example, let's just go ahead and lower this so you guys get an idea of what I'm talking about and then we'll do a little adjustment to this. Now let's click panel loops and you can see how much bigger my gap is. Okay, you guys see that? See the gap is bigger and look how much more shallow my bevel is because I've made that bevel more shallow. So if I start going closer to this surface, okay, and we'll undo and then panel loops. You can see how much more extreme my panel is getting because I'm making that panel more extreme. My gap is starting to stay about the same size because where I have the start of the panel loops is down here at the base and then ending here at the base. So of course what I can start doing is really having some fun with this. Okay, and start saying let's start pretty low. Okay, and then that's probably good right there what I like. And then let's go ahead and start higher and come my way up. So what I'm doing, oh, and of course we're going to save a project. So ZBrush now also comes with an autosave. So what we're doing is autosaving what I'm working on. Okay. So and this is also going to save undo history. It's also going to save any tool you have loaded, any sub tools.
Okay, so I've now got a different type of bevel happening here. Okay, so let's undo and see what we got. So we're going to hit panel loops. And now you can see we get a completely different bevel. So again, outer part of the surface, so you can see it's a little more shallow, then it starts to get more harsh, and you can see that panel actually happening. What's really cool about this, you guys start thinking about this, and I'm going to show you guys how you can use this to build metal suits, okay, is we've added capabilities to flip your curve. So we have vertical flipping, okay, and we have horizontal flipping. So the benefit of the vertical flipping is I can start creating almost like a key, like pieces fit together, okay, because I would do maybe one piece with this panel, and then I do another piece with the opposite, okay. So I can show you by, well, I'll show you guys that as we go for polygroups. Let's keep exploring this. So now we're starting to get a little idea here. We're starting to get, okay, it's starting to look like panels. It's starting to give me that Tron feel, but it feels still too soft, okay? So let's start playing with another feature, which is our polish, okay? Whenever you guys see this open and close square in ZBrush, that means that there's two algorithms, all right? So let's start, first start with, the closed circle, and let's turn our polish all the way up and hit panel loops. So this is what we got, okay? So let's do some snapshots here, just so you guys can see what we have, okay, as far as that goes. Let's undo that, and let's try open circle and see what we get. So you can see the drastic difference. When you guys have an open circle, we're going to polish the surface a lot more extreme, okay? which starts creating a lot more of a hard surface, okay? So you can see this is more about what I'm looking for, okay, to happen in here. And what we're doing is running this algorithm that we've added to this version, which is found in the deformation subpalette, which is right here, polished by features, okay? So what's really cool about this is you go, you know what? I want to adjust this a little bit, okay? So I'm going to switch to my new move brush, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and say, I want the eye maybe to, to start coming up. And you can see that only a portion's moving. Okay, if you guys remember what I had turned on in the brush palette is that mask by polygroups. So here's the big thing. Remember, this can be used for any brush. Okay, that's why we put it in the brush palette when we haven't made it specific. And I'm going to show you something else that's really cool in this section. Okay, so I'm going to turn that off so I can start manipulating the eye. Maybe I want to have the brow come up a little bit more maybe have a little bit more of an opening. Let's go with a smaller brush size and really start moving this around, okay? And let's say, let's make the, the nose come out a little bit more and do a little bit more like this. So you can see what starts to happen is we start to push and pull on our polygons, right? And for those that are ZBrush users, what you're under, obviously understanding is, is we're pulling on polygons, right? And we just don't have enough polygons for all the detail that I'm pulling on. I'm not really too concerned about that, honestly, because what I'm going to be able to do is reuse this algorithm. So if I do a polish by feature, okay, ZBrush is looking at all this surface and polishing it back. Okay? So let's go ahead and do that algorithm with the open and just kick it a little bit. And you can see that ZBrush is going to see can start polishing things back. All right, so here I'll go more extreme so you guys see what happens, and then I'll undo. Right, so we have the benefit not only having this feature when we're starting, but we have it later on down the line. So let's use our undo history and walk back in the time here. So I'm just walking through our time here, okay, that we have. So we have back to this piece again, because let's take another look at our mesh, okay? So there's a couple other things I want to show you guys. By default, we have this double on, all right? And by default, the loops is set to five. Okay, so what these two things are doing, number one, what loops is doing is saying, how many geometry loops do you want, okay, in here when we create the panels? Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Now, there's a good relationship here to what's going on here. If you guys are making a bunch of these little dots, you're going to need to probably up your panels, right, to be able to get stuff. So, for example, if I drop these panels, so say, let's say three and then panel loop, you can see I can't get what's here because I don't have enough geometry to get what's in here. So you can see the relationship between these panel loops, okay, that you're going to get, and here we'll give it the six, okay, and what you're getting in here. Okay, so those relationships are very important. 
And what double is doing, if you guys can see, here, let's just select out a portion, and, and then I can do Control-Shift-A, and now I've got that whole piece, because what double is doing is creating its own separate piece of geometry, okay, which is very convenient. So what I'm using is a visibility thing, okay? So I can select out just a portion, okay, and we're in the tool palette under visibility, okay, so tool palette, visibility, okay, and I'm going to undock the, the draw so it just doesn't, or I'll close it so it doesn't confuse you guys. So you can see I'm in the tool palette, visibility, and see there's a grow all, and I'm just using the shortcut. Okay, so then of course there's a grow selection and shrink selection, which is right here, grow and shrink. Okay, so I'm just using grow all to grow everything out. Very, very, very convenient. Okay, so you can see this is what double is doing. It's just creating individual pieces. Okay, so let's go backwards. Let's walk again backwards into our world. Okay, and we're going to go up one more. Okay, and take a look at with double off, what happens? So if I hit panel loops, okay, with double off, we're keeping the mesh connected. All right, so you can see that there's a nice bevel happening there. So the whole piece, so even if I did something like this, right, and do that control, see it's selecting out the whole thing. And what we're doing, if I select this polygroup right here, okay, we're creating that inner portion right here. Okay, so we're going to be able to do some cool tricks with this. But that's what that double is doing, okay? And to give you guys an idea, just to keep it simple, okay, let's just grab a sphere and show you a couple other features. This feature can't work with um, subdivision levels, okay? So I'm going to delete things so that all we have is this. And let's try, well, what if I'm a user that's in symmetry and I want to do something more like this, okay? But let's not do a square selection. Let's actually do a lasso selection. I lasso something out like this, okay? So I'm not showing the whole mesh. I haven't made a new poly group, okay? And let's just, just by default click that. So you can see what ZBrush does is it creates a new panel and deletes all that geometry around. So this gives you guys a really good idea what doubles have doing. Okay, let's turn double off and hit panel loops. You can see now it's not deleting, okay? So really to see that, let's up our thickness some and create some panel loops. So you see it's creating that purple piece in there for us, right? So what's really cool is, okay, well, let's, we know we can up our polish and panel loop that, okay? So if we look at this, you start getting this nice surface, and then, of course, we can continue polishing that back, okay? And then we can open it and say, let's go even a little bit stronger. So you guys can see what starts to happen here is we start creating some nice panels. So we can even do now the opposite. What if we want to go inward? Okay. So what I'm going to do is hit this inner button and hit panel loops and it creates a nice inner panel there. Right? So then I can continue to polish this a little bit more if I want to again. Okay. So polish by feature. And you can see I'm polishing that back. Okay. And the last thing that I want to show you guys with this, all right, is the capability to append. So when you only show a portion, okay, I can say append, all right, and we'll turn inner off and panel loop. What that's actually done is created a new piece of geometry, right? So here's the advantage of the control all, right? And I'm appending it, okay? So if I want to have double on as well, I can say double panel loop. Okay, and I have my polish turned way up, so that's why it's kicking into the surface. If I want to turn down that polish a little bit and panel loop, see it doesn't go so much into the surface. Right, so here's the advantage again of the grow all. I only have to grab a selection piece of it and then grow all, and you can see now I have the inner portion. So let's take this one more step further, and let's look at something like grabbing a, a dude. Let's grab the demo soldier, okay? And let's see what we can do with him. And let's only look at the demo soldier. Okay? And let's start doing what we are doing. Let's control W to polygroup everything. So again, we can use control W for visibility. We can use control W for masking out. So let's start building a little some kind of I don't know, some kind of a chest plate or some kind of metal thing. Maybe he's an astronaut or it's a sci-fi movie. Okay. And I'm just going to start creating some panels that I want. 
right? So let's say we'll have a panel coming across here. And let's go ahead again and turn on that mask by polygroups again so I can stay within that purple polygroup and then connect right up into the green, all right? And I know I'm not affecting the green, so that's a good one there. Let's add something here along the delt, okay? So let's just mask out in here because maybe there's going to be some kind of, I don't know, the logo to the army he's in or something like that. And then maybe let's go in through here, and he's got a piece through here, okay? And control W. And let's go one step further. Let's actually make a circular selection, okay? So I can do something like adding a circle, okay? And doing that, and then control W. Now, I again have what turned on. I have this on right now, this mask by polygroup. So I'm going to turn that off. Okay. And then let's now draw out our circle. Okay. And let's put that where I want. And then there you go. Okay. So if I want a more pronounced circle, okay, I would need obviously more geometry. So let's just let's just get something kind of all right. That's good enough for me. Control W. So now I have this piece in here. And I'm not trying to be perfect because I want to show you how good this can be. So now that we know we can hide and show things, I can say, okay, this is going to be the guy's chest plate and chest pieces. Okay? So I'm going to go to geometry. I definitely want to append this to the already existing guy. All right? I want it to be double sided. The elevation, okay, is going to be crucial for me because sitting at 100 means the panel loop, the panel is going to start here and work its way out. Okay? If I go to zero, then half of the panel is going to be sitting outside and half the panel is going to be sitting inside. Of course, we don't want that, right? Okay, because that means the metal sitting inside of them and we can't do that. And then if I went to a negative elevation, then it's going to do the opposite. It's going to start and always go inside. So I obviously want to be 100%. And then let's put a little thickness in this and panel loop it. Okay, so you can see I started creating panels. And of course, I'm polishing things. And I'm going to say, you know what, that's good enough for me. And let's start moving some things around. Okay? So I'm going to switch to the move brush. And there's already a brush that exists, okay, which is the move topological brush. Okay? What that's going to allow me to do all right, is start moving certain pieces. So you guys can see I'm only moving this top panel around. And then I can click the chest plate. Even though my brush size is big, that's not going to matter. Okay, so now I can start moving things around and manipulating. And maybe I want to start saying this needs to overlap this way. And then I want this one to push back in. Right, so if we look at just, oops, we look at just the panels. Okay, and we're looking at just these panels. I can start moving things around. Right, so how this is happening is another feature that we have. Okay, within the brush auto masking palette, okay, which is the topo topological button. So let's go back to the regular move brush and see how this is made. This is how easy it's made. Under brush, okay, you got this button right down here in the auto masking, which is topological. The minute I turn that on, ZBrush is only going to pay attention to topology. Okay, so. What that means to you guys, if we grab something here, let's let's just get simple again. Our favorite dog, we all need one. Okay. We're going to divide this up so you guys can really see what's happening. And let's just switch to the standard brush. I'm going to throw some color on him. Color, fill object. So I filled it with some white. I'm going to grab some red and I'm going to turn on this topological. So let's just start painting on him. So you can see no matter where I go, I'm way over here, and it's not painting. Everyone see that? I'll go to a little bit bigger brush size, and then I'll be able to paint more. Okay, so what this feature is doing is looking at your draw size and only allowing certain topology to be affected based upon your draw size and by the settings you have set here. So, for example, if I turn my range down to 1, and let's switch to a green color now, you can see even though I didn't change my draw size, I can only stay this big. I can't go any bigger. Right, so this becomes very handy. Just think about things like I want to start opening this guy's mouth, right? So I'm on the move brush. You can see his droopy face. Oh, sad dog. All right, let's play with this and say, you know what, the range is too high. Let's actually try 0.5. 
and you can see all I can manipulate now is the bottom lip, right? And I can't manipulate the upper lip at all, okay? So this becomes very, very, very handy, okay, to do this. So this is us giving the capability to combine these elements to start creating some really hard surface items. And you can see that even though when I was really low in polygons, right, when I was playing with even something like this, this is only sitting in 11,000 polygons, right? And let's turn off the green color. This still looks really nice, crisp, and clean. That's just what the poly panel loops is going to give you guys, is the capability to work really low in polygons, okay? So there's something else that we've done for this that correlates with that. How are we doing on time, by the way? I see that's 11.53. Uh, are we um, going to go for a little bit more? You're doing, you're doing good, Paul. We're good for a little bit more? You, yeah, you're good. Yeah, keep going. It's, okay. This is great. <clears throat> so another thing that we added that came in with these panel loops is this delete loop. So I just want to show this because obviously panel loops is dealing with hard surface. Okay. So I want to show you this cool feature, which is for hard surface as well. Okay. So I got this piece. All right. Let's delete the lower subdivision levels. All we have is this. Okay. So this is what we look like now sitting at 219,000 polygons. So what delete loops will do is start deleting edge loops, right? So do we really need all the edge loops in here and through here, right? Whoops, I drew out another one. In here to really define this part of the model. I don't think we do, or the bolts for that matter. They're just too, way too dense. So let's go crazy. Let's put it all the way up to 90 degrees. Let's not pay attention to polygrouping, and let's pay attention to partial, which means it's going to look at the openings and making sure that it's also deleting the edge loops at the openings as well. So I have an opening at the top and the bottom. So let's go ahead and delete loops. Let's see what we get. Oh, beautiful. Just triangular. Ah, uh, That's obviously way too destructive. Okay, so 90 degrees is way too high. So we're deleting anything that's 90 degrees and lower. So let's let's go half that and hit delete loops. Okay, we're starting to get there, right? So we're keeping anything 45 degrees and up. Okay, so it's still getting rid of too much of my surface, but you can see how quickly we're doing this. So let's go down to 10, deg 10 degrees and delete loops. Okay, we're getting there. That's looking better. So if you even think about something you're going to bring into an, a rendering engine, this is now only 1,200, and I pretty much got the look I got right here. All I need to do is smooth my normals, right? And then I've got exactly what's here in ZBrush. But let's take it another step further. Let's go all the way down to maybe two degrees and hit delete loops, and then there you go. So you guys can't really tell the difference. So we went from, what did we go from, 219,000 to 12,000. Right, and then what's this is still all quadded. So you can see we didn't need all the edge looping in here to take care of all that stuff. Okay, so that became a big benefit to us. Now, <clears throat> this is going to segue into that question that someone asked um, Novich about, and that's reverse engineering stuff from, like, say, Rhino or any other application free form that you guys have. So ZBrush only accepts polygons. We do not accept NURBs. So if you're going to come out from alias or anything like that, you need to have something that's converted into polygon. So what you can also do in ZBrush is I'm going to import actually a ring that I have that's from okay, a Rhino pack the Rhino package. Okay, you can see what we get here is a ring that's full of just different size triangles. Okay? So what I need to do is make this first something that's sculptural for ZBrush. Okay, and what I mean by that, if I switch to a brush here, that does pretty good damage, which is our clay buildup, all right? And I'm working symmetrical, okay? You can see I can start sculpting on this and damaging, but watch when I come up here on the top. Nothing's gonna happen until I get here to the edge, okay? And the reason that being, you guys can start seeing when I start destroying that, is the triangles are so big ZBrush isn't looking to sculpt on faces, it's looking to sculpt on vertex points. Okay, so that's why there's no vertex points here. Your first vertex points are along the edge. Okay, so you see there's enough here so we can sculpt. But it's just so changing of triangles far from
being these huge stretched ones to little, and you start getting this, right? And then you guys will also start, if you start subdividing, you start getting this ugly thing happening through here, okay? So since the question is asked, I want to show you guys uh, about that, all right? So you guys can see what happens with this, okay? So again, very important, let's save our ring. We definitely want to save our ring out, okay? So I'm going to undo our subdivision levels. And I'm going to show you guys quickly the Q remesher. Okay? So we have a Q remesher here that allows us to say, hey, take this ring. And what I like to do is I'm going to duplicate the ring. Okay? Because my goal is to try and get something that's low res. Okay? So I have a base ring and then I have the base ring. So maybe I'll rename it and call it retopo. Okay? So now that I have this retopo, I know which one I'm retopologizing on, and then I got my base ring. Okay, going back to the geometry because that's what I want to affect. Okay, your most important slider off the beat is this right here, your target polygon count. So this is the number of polygons in thousands. So by de default, it's set to 15. Let's just go right to four and let's see what happens. So I'm going to say 4,000. I'm going to make sure I have symmetry on, and all I have to do is click that Q remesh button. Okay, and ZBrush is looking at the mesh, analyzing it, and then giving us a new piece of geometry, okay, which is going to be completely quadded for us. So you can see now we have a completely quadded mesh. Right, so this is now very friendly to ZBrush. Now to get back that little base of that ring again, okay, all I need is to turn that base ring on, and now I'm going to start opening up this projection, okay tab that we have here, and I'm just going to say project all. And you can see what happens is we start taking that retopoed or that ring that we made with new geometry and we start shrink wrapping it to this base ring. Right? So we turn this off, you can see it's starting to try and capture that ring. So as I go up in subdivision levels okay, and keep projecting, this is really the way that I want to project all, is work my way up in subdivision levels and project all. Okay, because then it's really finding it easier to start projecting the surface. Now you can see what starts happening here is we're not quite capturing the edging. So let's go backwards. Okay, in here let's get down to the lower level again. Okay, which is here, and let's take a look at the most important slider in projection is this distance slider. So think about this as fishing. Okay, think about this rings the boat. Right, and our fishes are way out here. We need to cast a fishing line that can come out here and capture those fish, right? Because they're way over here. So that distance slider is pretty much saying this boat, how far do you get to cast out the mesh to start wrapping to the other mesh? Okay? So as I turn up this distance slider, and let's just go crazy and turn it up to one, I can do a project all. Right? So as I start walking up, I'm going full projection on this. Okay? So the surface is going to see start matching better and better because I've upped my projection range. Now on top of this, something that I don't see a lot of people using, and I want to show it okay, here for you guys. So let's change this color to red. All right, I'm going to turn off transparency. Let's fill this guy with a red color. Fill object. Let's go to this guy and let's change that to blue. Okay, and we'll color fill object so you guys can see what happens based on color. So the red one is the new mesh, okay? The blue one is the old mesh. Okay? That's the one I got from Rhino. So I have this projection shell and what I can do is project out the red until I see no more blue. And then it's going to snap back. And what I'm doing is turning on this projection shell and inner. So let's tell them the projection to do is you only actually get to project inwards from where we've set this projection shell. And of course I use two colors so I visually can see. So now when I hit project all, it's actually only projecting inward. It's all it's doing. Okay? And because we do color at the same time, I can still see that oh there's some red there. So I'm not quite snapping to the surface completely. So I need to go up in the subdivision level, project all, and it's going to keep doing this. And the cool thing about this that I colorize it, as I keep going, you're going to start losing red. Okay, and the more red I start losing, the better projection I know I've got. Right? So now I'm sitting at 264,000. 
and you can see I can start getting a better projection. So I just need to go one more subdivision level on this, okay? Which for the sake of time, I'm not going to do it because you guys would be like, all right, we get it, okay? So now I got something that I can start sculpting on, right? Which is high detail, okay? Let's turn that on, turn that black to white. And now I can start sculpting on this. And you can see I have all my detail, all right? And now to get this back out to something like a rhino or anything like that, okay, I would recommend using the decimation master. Okay, the reason being this tool is very powerful. It's the most popular thing used. We are used in about 10 to 10 industries, including things like toys and collectibles, because of because of something what I'm about to show you. We just want to add some detail in here. Okay. Looks like I still have topological on. Right, so let's add some more detail in here so you guys can see what happens. So now I have this ring, okay, with this detail. I'm going to snapshot that, and we made the plugin that's called the Decimation Master. Okay, so this is widely used for wrapper prototyping, CNC machining, toys, jewelry, ring, everything. Okay, so you're going to use something like Decimation Master and our 3D printer exporter, which, by the way, we can also import STLs now this way. Okay, not many people are aware of this, but you can now import that. So I'm going to go to the Decimation Master really quick. My first two steps are, do I want to freeze the borders and do I want to keep UVs? Number one, I don't have any UVs. Number two, I have no borders. Okay, what a border is, if I switch back to this, see this has got an opening, that's a border. I'm not really concerned about that because there is no border. Okay, so then what I'm going to do is just tell it now to pre-process the current. So what we're doing is looking at this, and why we're pre-processing this, I'm going to come over the question. Keep an eye on the left corner. It gives you the percentage of the pre-process that's being done. Okay? You could also do this exact same workflow for cleaning scans. Okay? Turning stuff into a DynaMesh will help you clean your scans out. Okay? There's so many avenues to do this with. Okay? So now that we pre process this, let's go ahead and decimate it. Okay, so this is what we have in polygons right now, right? So we have we have this sculpturally, and we have this polyframe. So let's just start with the default decimate current. There, it's done. Okay, so what we've done now is triangulated the mesh, and we're taking a really good look at where you sculpt and making sure that stays, and we're looking at where the surface changes. Okay. What's great about this is I can say, well, let's keep going lower. Let's just use the percentage, decimate, right? I just went lower. Still no real big change here. Very nice. Let's go all, let's get crazy. Let's go all the way to 1%. There we go. Definitely some, some change there. But take a look at how great this is doing, holding that real ring size there and keeping that ring edging there. So at any point in time, you go, whoa, I went way too low. Right, let's go back up to 5%, and I can either go by K polys or points. Okay, so poly means polygons, okay? And then this means points, vertex point order, okay? So then I can say let's go back to 5%. Okay, so you can see the points are 13, okay, to the thousands, okay, so 13, 216, and we got 13,216 active points. That means vertex points. Since this is triangles, you've got to double that number, and that's actually the number of polygons you have. Okay? So then there you go. Now I can reverse engineer anything that I want. Okay? So I can either turn things into a DynaMesh, if I wanted to with the same token, or I can Curie Mesh it. All right? So things I'm bringing in the Rhino and taking out, and then getting it out, I can turn it into a DynaMesh, or I can use this Decimation Master. Does that um, clear up the question for the, the gentleman that was asking uh, us before we did the meeting? Are there any other questions about that? Randy's well, asking, yep. um, sorry about is there that. a source for all keyboard that. shortcuts? <clears throat> yes, there definitely is. I'll show you guys where that is. Okay. So right here in pixelogic.com, okay. if you go here to education, we have online docs. Okay. So we're actually working on a new one that we're going to be launching soon. We're super excited about it. You have the capability right here, which is just pretty much the ZBrush Wiki, 
okay, and keyboard shortcuts right here. And you can also get to the Getting Started Guide here as well. Now you have all the defaulted ZBrush shortcuts. Don't forget, you can also, all right, hold that control key over, and then anytime you see, see, see like pers perspective, okay, see that P, okay, this is giving you shortcuts when I hover over it, and when I hold the control key and hover over it, I get what the buttons are saying. So you can actually learn right here inside ZBrush. So you see that the floor is Shift P. So if I do Shift P, that activates my floor on and off. And obviously P is perspective. Okay, so that's where you can get those features. And <clears throat> also on top of that, I said that I would show you guys a little bit about more about the horses, so you know. Again, we have the panel loops tutorials here for you guys. Right here in the ZBrush tutorial section, you guys might want to visit this. There's some really great threads in here. This did you know that thread is actually my thread that I'll put things like this up on. So I put you know some things up here on the horse. Okay, so it's later on in the thread, and this is where a lot of people will come and will ask questions to each other, and it's a great resource. I think it's on uh, page 11 now. And here you go. So pretty much what I did with you guys here, I did it again, but I used Z-Spheres to do the whole horse this time. So this is also another place that you guys could go to to see what happens. Okay? And notice what I'm pointing out here, which I didn't have point in this webinar. Wherever there were three polygroups meeting, okay? So what I mean by that is really quickly, let me hop back into ZBrush, okay, which I think it's saving again. We'll wait for that to save. This is a very important piece. I'm going to sell it on the market. Who wants it? Okay. So to keep it simple, let's keep it simple again, just so you guys get what's happening here. All right, let's start making some polygroups. Okay, so I, if I'm going to use panel loops, I can't have any subdivisions. So what I mean by three polygroups, okay, is when I do something like, oh, here, we'll just do that. That's great. Control W. Okay, let's switch back to my masking pen. Let's say there's a polygroup there, there's a polygroup there, okay, and there's a polygroup here. Okay, so if you look at this, there is the red, the pink, and the green all meeting here, right? Here, there's just the green and the red, okay? So if I was to edge loop this with the open circle, so let's go really extreme, let's up this a little bit, and panel loop, you can see that, see how this is going really harsh here, and right here it's going very harsh, but this is rounded. That's because when you have this open circle, we're looking at where three polygroups meet and making sure that kisses a harsh point. So this is going to stay harsh. This is going to get rounded, harsh, harsh in here because there's three polygroups. So when I panel loop that, you can see harsh, harsh, harsh. So now that I know that, I started building my horse that way and thinking about it, okay, and thinking about it in that approach, okay? So this becomes very handy to think about, and so that's what I'm also showing in that thread, okay? What is the new control masking shortcut, control W? So Yari uh, is asking, okay, if I want to make a new polygroup and I'm showing the whole thing, just control W? Obviously, that also works, okay, if I do this and I want to make a polygroup, control W. So now you can either make polygroups this way or you guys can just even mask things out the way you want, right, and then control W, right, because what if you start going, well, hey, let's grab, let's get crazy and let's grab a shape to mask out with, right, and then I can control W that and now I get that shape, okay. So it's just control W for both. You have to pre Christie's asking when do you pre process current? You pre process current, that's your that's your second step. That's kind of why we set it up this way. Your first step, okay, in the decimation master is see this option one, do you want to freeze border? Do you have UVs on the mesh and you want to keep it? And if you have any masking on it, do you want to have that masking be more appreciated? Then you immediately go to pre process. You can't decimate until you pre process. So if you try to decimate, it's gonna tell you you haven't pre processed anything. Okay, because what preprocess is doing is creating a temp file and actually decimating from zero to 
100. Okay? Does that answer that question for you, Christy? William's asking if we can go over subtraction. Are you asking for subtraction using DynaMesh and using with insert mesh brushes or using it with the subtool? Well, I can do both, actually, really quick. Um, how's the time there for Novich for you guys? I'll keep talking all day. That's just what we do. Um, I think we want to um, start wrapping that up, in, wrapping this up in 15 minutes. In 15 minutes? Or in a couple 15, minutes? 15, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, a couple minutes too, but yeah, you have another few we'll keep, minutes. No, we won't go. Heck no, we won't go. Heck no. Okay, so someone's asking about subtractive, okay? So Dynamesh is going to be the best approach. And by the way, this new version, we've redone that algorithm for Dynamesh, okay? for extraction, for make 3D, for panel loops, because we're using that new polish by, polish by feature, so there's less sh shrinkage actually happening in your mesh. And what I mean by that is for those that are DynaMesh experts, if I went down really low and in the old ZBrush, I started taking this guy and going, hey, let's put some ears on him, right? This is pretty getting pretty thin, right, and out there. When you would read DynaMesh, you would lose a lot of that volume, practically all of it. You can see now, you don't, even though my resolution is way down. Okay? So if I go way back up, okay, and I start playing with this, you can see that that's pretty much staying, which is really, really nice. Okay, so let's select an insert mesh brush, okay, cylinder. And all I have to do is hold down the Alt key, and you can see it becomes white. When I let go, it's going to inverse the normal, so that gives you a visual. Number one, you have the white telling you it's a negative. You have the normals not showing, which tells you it's a negative as well. So all I have to do is control, click, and drag, control, click, and drag. Okay, and what's happening is that's being used now as a negative. Okay, and the thing to keep in mind, guys, you can grab anything, right? So anything here that's an insert mesh brush, we can grab it, right? So if we want to say grab this ring, right, I can hold it negative. All right, and let's move it out of the surface a bit. Okay, so that way, doing something more like that. Okay, and then we'll clear and control W again. And then there you go. So now I've just made that, if you guys can see, going through here. Now what's great about this, and when we added in this feature, and I'll show you a great video to watch that's by Joseph Drust, is what if I did something like this? I say, okay, how, what if I've already got pieces of it got set up in another application and I want to bring them all in? Of course you can bring them all in, okay? So let's just say I did. Let's just say it's a pen, uh, a cylinder, okay? So now I got this awesome cylinder. Yay! And I want to change the size of the cylinder, okay? So I'm just going to turn on my transparency so I can see inside and let's just make the cylinder smaller, okay? And I'm using size, and then let's go along, no, nope, let's not go along the Y. Looks like we're going to go along the Z. Okay, if I want again, be sure, turn on the floor grid, and I can use that blue line right there, and I know that's Z, so I'm only going to turn on Z, and let's just stretch this out. Okay? So what I've done is used this, okay? this cylinder to go through him, all right? Notice my polygroups, okay? So I'll go red, and this is a DynaMesh. So this is key, you gotta make this a DynaMesh. This is not. All I'm gonna do is use this little Boolean options right here. These are unify, okay? That's difference, and this is intersect. So I'm gonna put on difference for that cylinder. I wanna use that cylinder as a whole, kind of like I did here, okay? So now I'm gonna say, okay, come here, and I want to merge these so I can use it as a Boolean, all right? So all I'm going to need to do is open that and say merge down. I don't need to weld, so I'm turning off my weld points. And look what happens. That cylinder became white, okay? So now that's a negative. So all I have to do, okay, is just redynamesh, which is control, click, and drag. And there you go, you got a hole. So really, really good videos for this for you guys that I would strongly recommend on this because Joseph did a fantastic job, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, on these videos is again, if we go to the Pixelogic okay, main site, OK, 
Okay. In under education, video tutorials. All right. Under sculpting, because we're using that as a sculpting technique. Right here, all these military things, which, by the way, this is how they do this at his studio, which he works at uh, Ubisoft, right? Right here, I would start with this modeling on radio part one, okay? This shows exactly what I just did, but even in a more complex approach, and the approach where he created pieces in another application and brought them in as negatives, okay? <clears throat> Is there any um, questions? Paul, can I, Someone's asked me, can I show an example of dynamic brush? When you say dynamic, are you, oh, you want to use the dynamic? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking about the brush size dynamic. Sure, ZBrush is changing. So I'm going to take a couple questions, guys, from in the Novich group, if that's okay, for, for me, guys. Do what you got to do. About why I want to. No, I, I, good, this good. is going really good. I mean, um, yeah. Go for it. Well, I need to have lunch soon, guys. but it's okay. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. We don't eat lunch in this industry. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so <clears throat> where the dynamics can become huge for you guys. Let me show you two examples, and this should hit home for you guys. I'm going to go grab a brush. We all do things with, like, scales or certain things, certain size. So I'm going to grab something that is scales. Okay? So how about going into the scales folder, and let's grab something like this lizard scale because it's, and go bigger, okay, because it's very, okay, particular. In fact, let's start by turning off dynamic. Okay, so dynamic's off. Okay, so we'll go this size and go, wee, awesome. Yeah, this is looking really good. I'm really loving what this is. It's looking good. What happens is when I come in like this, okay, and then do it, so your scales are completely a different size. Not so good, right? So watch what happens when I turn on that dynamic feature, okay? And then now I got these scales, and then I zoom in, okay? See the scales are the same size, even if I zoom out. So this is where that dynamic feature comes in really handy. Or let's take something like what we are playing with in this brush, okay? So I'm going to say, let's grab that piece again, all right? And I start drawing this out. I'm going to say, oh, yeah, that's the size I'm looking for on this guy, okay? I start playing with this. There's no way I'm going to get the same size, okay? What you can do is do this and hold the control key, and then, okay, when I'm holding out an insert mesh brush, ZBrush is automatically going to snap to the, to the brush size, okay? So you see how big my brush size is? See it's snapping to the brush size? So if I went smaller, and I do that and hold the control, see how tiny it got? So what's going to happen is if we turn dynamic off, okay, and we do that same thing, okay, control, and then you come in closer, do that same thing. See, they're not the same size. Not, not so good. Not, not, not so good, okay? So let's turn that dynamic on and do the same process. Drawing it out, holding the control key, coming in closer, drawing it out, holding the control key, drawing it out, holding the control. See that? All the same size. Very convenient, right? Very nice to be able to do this, right? So now I can, no matter what, I can start working around and figure out where I want to put these things. Maybe, I don't know, there's going to be some wiring that's going to connect through this. I don't know, maybe this is becoming some kind of underwater bomb. I have no idea, okay? So that should give you the answer to your uh, dynamic question. Does that answer? Okay, cool. He said, cool, thanks. Can you create a library in ZBrush, Rafi's asking. Of course, you, you mean by library of brushes? Because that's what also the insert mesh brushes are doing, is creating libraries of geometry, right? So we have brushes like this, okay, where I can go, all right, I'm going to grab, let's grab some chains, all right, and then I can draw out chains, and then at any point in time I can switch that to here something more like that. So this is just a library of items. Right? And what's really cool, watch this guys, if we have a little fun here, let's have some fun real quick with this. Okay, and let's just do a quick little poly grouping here. Alright? So we'll turn on this. 
and let's do them. Well, let's get rid of this star. And let's control our masking. Control W, and then I'm looking at just this piece. Okay, if I go to stroke, all right, and I open up these features, you see this frame mesh. Okay, when I click this, all right, what that's doing is creating a frame. You guys see that? Creating a frame around that. So maybe what I want to do first is actually let's polish this back a little bit. Okay, so it becomes a little more rounded. Right? Like that. Then show maybe just this. Okay? Stroke, frame mesh. So it's nice and rounded. Right? Now if I just click on the brush, see what's happening? Because I'm using a brush with already curve mode on it, it's just going to keep reusing the brush. So I can go smaller. And see, I can put these buttons around any circular motion around this guy. So it's about just a couple steps, and it's about thinking a little bit outside the box, guys, and that's what a lot of these features are. And now I can say stroke, and let's delete, and then now I have this almost looks like anything, but it was bolts instead, which we have bolts. This is some kind of maybe metal hole that I could have created, right? Because now I could even say this has got no subdivision levels, okay? And right now I have lasso. I can start doing crazy stuff like this. If I wanted to, switching to <clears throat> this, right? And I can say, let's extrude inward, right? And then let's switch to move. And then there you go. And now I've just created some kind of hard edge piece, right? So very cool to be able to do this, okay? So just another food for thought. So. What last minute questions since the, the Pixelogic team has been answering some questions and anything that I missed? Paul, there was, there was, a, there was quite a few questions on um, ZBrush performance that I was hoping maybe you could answer. Um, mainly uh, using graphics cards. Uh, a couple people wanted to know what your system was, how much RAM you're using, uh, stuff like that. Sure. My system is really old. It's actually pitiful. <laughs> I'm actually only using a Core 2 Duo processor, okay, with 8 gigs of RAM. That's it. So see, I'm not using anything spectacular. I'm still using Snow Leopard, okay. So not using anything spectacular. We actually don't use the video card at all because we're all software renders, so there's no video card. And a misnomer, just because uh, Salman brought it up, I want to go into something really quick, really quick here, and that's the mem here. I see a lot of people going, hey, turn the compact memory up all the way, turn these undos up all the way. I'd actually recommend not doing that, okay? So what the compact mem is doing is when you're not using ZBrush, that's the memory that gets allocated to ZBrush. So let's say if I switch to my window browser or switch to my Firefox, that's setting how much RAM ZBrush gets to use when it's not being used, okay? And this is setting the limit of un undos that you can do per tool or, or document, but now that we have undo history here, we've got 10,000 undos, okay? So you don't even need to change that anymore, okay? So what you actually can do is in your preferences, you can control your undos here. And by default, we give you 10,000, okay? So which is plenty. Okay, in fact, there are a lot of people, especially in production, dropping this like a thousand or five hundred because they're saying that's enough, right? And then you can save that out as your preference by holding Control Shift and I, all right? And then that will be very handy for you guys, especially those in production world. Does that take care of that? Those performance questions? Yeah, I think so. I think that was all. Um, and th there was one more too. Um, uh, I think his name is Kyle. Hey uh, guys, if I can about. interrupt you. Sure. Hey guys, if I can interrupt you for a second. Um, we have four minutes left. So what I would suggest is that maybe we take one last question and then um, we will email you all the questions that are left and we can publish a Q&A tomorrow whenever you're ready with the answers on our blog. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, what's the last question going to be, Solomon? The pressure's on. Uh, if you want to pick it, go for it. This was just right. one that I thought might, I don't know if you touched on this. I was kind of answering questions. But um, he said, uh, I see the Decimation Master often leaves holes when he's trying to verify the mesh. Um, 
he's talking about trying to figure out a way to guarantee watertight for printing. Um, leaving holes in the fact that when you're looking at it in ZBrush, it looks like there's holes, or you're bringing in another application and it's showing that there he's are. He's sending holes. it over to Rhino. Okay. It's it's not necessarily holes. It could just be a flipped normal. And uh, we're already the, the decimation master is already being used completely in production, and uh, I've got no one telling me that there's holes when they use it in production. So, but of course you could fix holes quickly in ZBrush as well if you wanted to, right? So if I wanted to make sure, if you guys just wanted to do it in ZBrush, right? If we want to say there's a hole in this guy, okay? So the thing you'll have to understand here: do we have that? This. So this right here, right? ZBrush by default is only going to show show you normals facing the camera. So and just because there's triangles and one might be stretched, it might look like there's a hole. Something first you might want to do is in here in the display properties, turn on double, right? Just look right in here how different this is because you can't see the faces facing that way, right? So we turn on double. Now you can see the faces. That's the first thing I would do. And the last thing you might want to do is under geometry. Okay, uh, under modify topology, we have closed holes right here. So you can close the holes. If there are any holes that need to be closed, ZBrush will do it. And it'll use triangles to close the hole. So you could do those two things after you decimate if you want to be 100% uh, sure. And then you should definitely not have any holes, and that'll be watertight. All right, um, so uh, I guess we'll wrap that up, huh? <sighs> There's, uh, we're getting so many questions from everybody coming in uh, from the attendees, Paul. Yeah. It's all over now. It's all over. Well, we Calm can down, do, guys. We can, we can do as much as we can. We'll see what questions we can answer. We might not be able to answer all of them because, like I said, some of these questions, I need mm -hmm. to ask a question to make sure exactly what they're looking for. So. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, just for the attendees, if your answers don't get answered by Paul, um, what we'll do is we'll probably have uh, a Q&A session. And then uh, we'll post these questions. We'll share these questions with Paul and his team at Pixelogic. And we'll probably make a post, a blog post, at our uh, blog.noveg. Sounds cool? Yep. Awesome. Sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess we're, uh, we'll switch back to me then. Sorry, guys. Okay. <laughs> Take it away, our fun. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'll probably leave a little bit of time um, after the recording is over. But I'll be go over a little bit more questions if that's okay with you guys. Yeah. Let's do that. Sure. Okay. Sure. All right. Switch presenter to me. Okay. You want me to do it? Um, I got it. I'll pull the trigger. Okay. Blam. Do it. Do it. Do it. Cool. All right. Do you guys see my screen here? Awesome. Uh, it's so quiet. Sorry, guys. Sorry, attendees. But... Thank you guys for attending our latest No Veg webinar series. Paul, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, first of all, uh, yeah, we really want to express our gratitude for you guys for coming out. And for the attendees, just, you know, all the way from Russia, uh, different parts of the world, just to join us to, to hear you guys uh, talk about ZBrush as well. So if you guys want to hear more about ZBrush, I know Paul already talked about it. You guys can check out www.pixelogic.com. There's a community. There's a tons of resources as well. I think uh, Paul was talking about the forums. And also, if you guys want to learn more how to model that horse, go there. Check it out. And if you guys want to purchase the latest version of ZBrush 4R5 for Windows, uh, and you guys are in the United States, we at NoVeg, as the leading online design software store, we have ZBrush 4R5 for Windows available as a digital delivery with zero sales tax. Um, Paul, um, I guess in your own words, uh, how, you know, is there any way, like, convince, convince the attendees why they should purchase ZBrush? <laughs> Since you're the expert here. Because I'm real funny and my jokes are real bad. No. Uh, well, <laughs> we're used in a lot of different ways, guys, right? So it's, it's really an artistic tool, right? And we're used in about 10 fields. And we can say all that. But really what it's about is creating artwork and creating something and using this medium that's a computer now. But giving that freedom and not having to push and pull polygons or if you're from that nerve-based world, drawing out all these curves and then you've got to rely on the curves and you're going to affect the curves will still affect your surface. It's more literally having like a ball of play and then you just get going. 
Many people teach ZBrush themselves, including myself, because you can just you can get up and get moving. Obviously, I showed you guys a lot of resources to help you along the path in a way. I saw some people asking where there's classes in the LA area. So there's there's plenty of schools. There's online schools to go to, and we do have a third party page on our site that'll give you all those those uh, sections with the schools that are in your area as well that you can take classes or even online courses as well. There's also, don't forget to mention Z Classroom. Z Classroom. Yeah, I was in with the video tutorials. Yep. Cool. All right. I hope that was convincing enough, guys. I know a lot of you guys are in-betweeners as well, uh, but if you're a new user, uh, if you're a Rhino user taking a look, definitely do check it out. And also, here is another plug for our next upcoming webinar. Uh, in two weeks, we'll be having Michael Gunther from uh, VSR, who he'll be coming in to talk about high-end surface modeling in Rhino 3D with VSR. So for more details about this upcoming webinar, check out novedge.com forward slash webinar series. Uh, if you guys have any questions, comments, or feedback, uh, email me, shoot me a message at kevin at novedge.com, and also you guys can uh, shoot a message to Bob, too, as well. And um, some of you guys... Uh, Probably had to leave early um, because we went to a lot of detail. Uh, not my fault. It's Paul's fault. Sorry, guys. Uh, it's always my fault. I, I always, you. always. <laughs> uh, but if you guys missed something, or if you guys want to rewatch the part about the horse, the ball, and how to like you know uh, transfer objects uh, for Rhino, uh, you can catch all of our uh, Novich webinar series, including this one, uh, after today, uh, at YouTube.com uh, forward slash Novich, and also Vimeo.com forward slash Novich as well. Um, and on behalf of the Novich marketing team and the rest of the Novich sales team, we want to thank you guys for joining us today. Um, see you guys around. Paul, do you guys do you have any last words before we sign off on this? Uh, you yeah, know, if you guys uh, the best place too to go for some of these questions, if you guys also make a thread specific, you know, Uber Central, you know, you get answered by our user base before we even answer you too. So it's a good location to get information. Thank you so much, guys, for participating. This was great. Cool. And also follow us at No Veg yep, Store. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. Signing off. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Have a great day and have a great weekend, everyone. All right. Enjoy your lunch. You enjoy your lunch, too. I'll try. <laughs>